I know we're in a political season. I'm somebody who's always remained apolitical, and I, and I tend to stay that way. Although, I'm a massive fan of, 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 of the sport of politics. When I say I'm a fan, I'm interested. I stay engaged. I watch all the news channels. I watch all the shows that I can, listen to podcasts, listen to uh, YouTube uh, channels that, that deal in politics. And I, I like to take in... The viewpoints of all sides uh, of, of certain political issues, because it's my belief to where I how can I know if I truly and strongly believe in something if I don't hear the opposing view to it. Right. So I'm someone who's always been politically independent and politically minded, and I, I'm not I am not uh, alone in that. Now, I am not ever going to get on one side of an issue or another on this show because eh, that's not what I it's not what I want to do. I'm not interested in that now. If you hear me maybe on Hall of Fame with Booker and I, sometimes we get into some political things, and there are certain things that I believe in that I will speak up on very strongly. But when it comes to whomever you're going to vote for, I let the people who want to discuss that, they can discuss it. And one of the guys is Rob Reiner. Rob Reiner, you know from All in the Family. You know him as a legendary director and actor. He is the son of the uber legend Carl Reiner, who um, everybody has been a fan of. Even my generation of people know him from the Ocean's Eleven movies. Really great talent. We lost him earlier this year. Rest in peace, obviously, to the great Rob, uh, Rob not to Rob Reiner, to the great Carl Reiner. Excuse me, I'm not trying to put that on Rob. But um, I talked to Rob. He was promoting an event that he was doing that was a fundraiser for a particular political party. Now, during this, we talk little politics, just a little bit. I let him voice his opinion. Because that was part of the deal. He was going to voice his opinion. But I did get to ask him about some stuff that I've always wanted to ask him about. Uh, working with Andre the Giant on The Princess Bride. Being directed by Martin Scorsese in one of my favorite movies of all time, The Wolf of Wall Street. And, but these go to 11. We talk, this is Spinal Tap. So I don't want to waste any time. I think that it is the appropriate time to talk to the legendary Mr. Rob Reiner on The Brad Gilmore Show. Or demand. Oh, Brad, what have you done now? Now, now? And he joins me now, the legend himself, Mr. Rob Reiner is in the building. Rob, how you doing? Hey, good, Brad. How are you? I'm I'm great. I'm so excited to talk to you because I'm a major fan of yours. Uh, when I saw this opportunity to talk to you, it, it was incredible. I had just spent maybe last week an hour watching this YouTube playlist of some of the greatest scenes that, from films that you have directed, and then I saw all this uh, Seinfeld making of, so it's just a pleasure to talk to you this morning. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about, though, what you're here to talk about, and it's always fun. This, this pandemic, the, I guess the good thing about it, if there is a good thing, is we've gotten to see a lot of people reunite. Uh, I just saw a trailer for a West Wing re reunion they're doing on HBO Max, and now Spinal Tap is reuniting, uh, holding a virtual reunion a fundraiser for the Pennsylvania Democrats. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, we're doing this uh, on the 15th, and uh, it's going to be hosted by uh, Patton Oswald and myself and Michael McKean and, and Chris Guest and Harry Shearer will all be there. We're going to show clips from the film. We're going to talk about it. We're going to take uh, questions from, from uh, the viewers that are watching. And like you say, it's to raise money for the Pennsylvania Democrats. And you're right. There have been a number of these uh, reunions. I did one a couple of weeks ago for Princess Bride, and we had the whole cast back from Princess Bride and did a reading of that. So uh, it's a lot of fun. It's fun for the for the audience. And the main thing is that we're raising money to to win Pennsylvania for the Democrats, uh, you know, on the third. And and uh, it's a critical state. You know, it was won by Trump the last time, and we got to get this guy out of the White House. He's an absolute raving lunatic, and if we have another four years of him, I worry that our democracy won't uh, won't exist anymore. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's just it's just cool for people to get together for a cause, especially something that they strongly believe in, no matter what, right? It's it's nice for everyone to get together, and and for me, Spinal Tap, 
So I, I come from the world of music, and I think that every every person who's ever stepped inside of a recording studio at all or has spent any time around music venues has had to have seen Spinal Tap. This is Spinal Tap. And I, I tell you, Rob, it was an inside joke for years and years and years that I would always say, yeah, but these go to 11. It's one of the great yeah. lines in the history of cinema, yeah. I think. Um, and, yeah. and, and the thing is, whenever you're making something like that, did you know that Spinal Tap was going to have that resonance that it had? Or were no, you unsure about it? No, you never know. It? You just, you know, you're working on something. You don't know if it's going to be good or not. I mean, uh, you know, we thought it was funny, but uh, I, I can tell you two things. When we first screened it in Dallas, they, they thought they didn't understand it. They kept saying to me, why would you make a movie about a band that's, that's, that nobody ever heard of? And, and they're so bad. <laughs> and, and I said, well, it's a satire. And the guy who was shooting the film, our, the cinematographer, he had shot a lot of rock and roll documentaries and that's why I hired him and while we we're shooting he kept saying I, I don't understand what's funny about this this is exactly what they do and I said yeah but it's a little bent you, you have to see that it's not exactly it's a little bent so you never know you never know what people are gonna take to or not take to yeah it's just I think that if if you if you're in on it right from the get-go and you and you get the joke uh, kind of like Best in Show or some of those other great mockumentaries in the history of, of, of entertainment. It's just such a fun ride, and it's cool that it still is around today. People still want to see that. I mean, I know people have to be so excited for this, as well as the Princess Bride one. Because for me, Rob, I also come from the world of pro wrestling. I spent a lot of time working in pro wrestling, and of course, every pro wrestling fan knows Princess Bride because of Andre the Giant. Um, right, how, right. How, how, yeah, was, was. how was it to work with Andre? Oh, he, he was great. I mean, the guy was, you know, the classic gentle giant. I mean, he really was that. I mean, he was the sweetest man, and he was so smart. I mean, really smart guy. Uh, he told us stories about when in this town that he was from in France that he used to go to school, that this, uh, Samuel Beckett would walk him to school. I mean, so these are the kind of influences he had. But he was an amazing guy, and one story, he also would could drink pretty good. <laughs> He was, yes. you know, he liked to drink once in a while. And, and one day he comes to work and I said, Andre, what did you do last night? He says, oh, I went to the bar, I had a couple of drinks. I said, well, what do you, what do you, what do you drink? He says, oh, you know, I had about uh, six bottles of wine, three bottles of cognac. I said, Jesus. I said, you must have been drunk. He said, no, no, I don't get drunk. I was a little tipsy, but not drunk. <laughs> so he, was, he, was, he was a great guy, though, really sweet guy. I mean, yeah, that's what everybody says. The the drinking stories are legendary, where he would just throw back a hundred beers in one sitting and be able to walk out with no problem. Uh, what yeah. what an anomaly of a human being! And did you find his? Because he wasn't a trained actor by any sense of the imagination, but he did come from the world of entertainment, from the pro wrestling aspect. Did you find that him working with him on set in the scripted format, did he take to that well, or did it take a little extra direction? He, he did. He did eventually. I was nervous about going with him because he had never acted before, and when he came in and did the audition, I, I had him read a scene, and I couldn't really understand what he was saying. He was perfect for the part, but it was, like, impossible. And I said, you know, Andre, this is going to be like a 15-week thing. You're going to be around. And he thought that he had to do three pages for 15 weeks. I said, no, no, no. You're throughout the whole script. This is just one scene. You're in the whole movie. He says, I do it. I do it, boss. And I went, oh, no, I don't know if I could do it. So I, what I did is I taped his entire performance. I put it on a cassette. And I sent it to him, and he listened to it over and over and over again. By the time he got to the set, he had it down. He was he had it nailed, and he was he was so good because I thought I'm going to have to loop everything, you know, I'm going to have to replace his dialogue, you know. But he was per I didn't have to change a line, and he was perfect. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure, man. It was, and what a classic movie and classic performance from him. You know, Rob, though, I said I'm a fan of yours, and I really truly mean that. And I love this your style. Every film that you do. You, you feel that Rob Reiner style. And even the films that I feel like you choose to act in, they all are big on dialogue and that conversational style. Um, even going back to... Yeah, I like character pieces. That's my, you know, that's what I know. You know, my dad used to say all the time, you know, he just passed away recently, but he always my used to say, right, you know, create from where you know, from what you know. In other words, let it be an extension of yourself in some way. And that's the only way I know how to do it. And most of the things... 
I do are character driven. You know, I've done some things that aren't, but most everything I do is is that, and that's that's the only way I know how to create stuff. I, I, and I think that that's it's one hundred percent. I think the reason why. I and so many other people like the work that you do, whether it be behind the camera or on screen, even working at a film like The Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, that was a big character study about Jordan Belfort, right, and, and everything that he did. Was it was it cool for you to, as talented of a director as you are, have to sit there and take direction from somebody like Martin Scorsese? Well, if you're lucky enough to be in a Martin Scorsese film, you, you know, it's easy. I mean, the guy, first of all, he's brilliant. He's an obviously one of the great film directors of all time. But he also is smart enough when working with actors to let them go. If he knows an actor can improvise or, or make it more real, he did. And, and it's funny because I was talking to Jonah Hill, you know, we became kind of friends after that. And, and, you, and with Leo, too, it's, it's like you, he, if you're with people who can do that, in other words, can, can improvise and go back and forth with each other, you can find some of the best uh, stuff that way. I mean, that Spinal Tap was completely improvised, and Marty would always let us do that. And like you say, when you get with good horses, like uh, Jonah was incredible. I mean, he just was easy to just bounce back and forth with. But I was surprised how good Leo was. I mean, he was really comfortable just you know, improvising and allowing things to, 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 you know, to find these things. And Marty was amazing at letting you do that. So what a pleasure to work with him. Absolutely. Now, again, this fundraiser that's going down is for Pennsylvania Democrats. Have you always been politically active and, and politically minded? Yeah, pretty much so. I mean, I grew up in a household where my mother and father were both uh, very politically active. My father marched in the moratorium against the Vietnam War. My mother was part of a group called Another Mother for Peace, and they put that. There was a very famous poster in the 60s called uh, um, Child, uh, War is Unhealthy for Children and Other Living Things. And uh, it was against the Vietnam War, and they were very involved in, in uh, racial issues, and so on, you know, which gave, you know, when I did go to Mississippi, and I've done some things and I've and I've been you know I, I was actually chairman of a state commission here in California for seven years on early childhood and we were the my wife and I and, and Chad Griffin were the first to file a federal lawsuit to that led the way to marriage equality in in, in the country so you know I, yeah I've been involved in in politics you know since I'm a, a young person so how do we get this is my biggest question because I, I've spent so much time around young people and it's hard to get them to be politically active and engaged and even register to vote. How do you think that we can reach the younger generation more and, and, and tell them why? Because when I first voted, Rob, in you know when I was 20 is the first time I voted, when I was able to vote, I really didn't even know what I was voting for. I think a lot of people, right. they just vote based on, it's almost like, you know, do you drink Coke or Pepsi? Whatever your dad drank is what you drink yeah. too, so it's who you vote for. It wasn't until I got older that I started looking at things differently. How can we get people more engaged and involved at an earlier age? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting, but usually it's the issues that affect young people that will galvanize them into action. When I was young, <clears throat> like I said, the Vietnam War was going on, and people, you know, were worried about fighting in a war they didn't believe in and going off to die and all that. And that was a galvanizing issue that got everybody, you know, make love, not war, and all, you know, the hippie movement and all that stuff. Now you've got some basic issues that young people really are gravitating towards. One is, you know, uh, gun, you know, gun control and seeing, uh, you know people shot up in schools and David Hogg and his group are, are out there uh, registering people. Also the environment, and that's an all-encompassing issue that affects everybody. And young people are very uh, cognizant of climate change and what's happening. And it is causing young people to get more engaged uh, th than otherwise. But normally, young people, they don't think about these things. You're right. They don't care about it. But when it directly affects them, like student loans, things that uh, affect them personally, they'll get more engaged. And then they'll see which candidate is in favor of reducing student loans, which candidate cares about the environment, which candidate cares about gun safety. And when you then you start seeing, oh, I want to I want that person because that person cares about the things that I care about. It's going to be an interesting night come uh, the, the November the 3rd, 2020. But Rob Reiner, thank you so much for joining. It's just a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me.